So I made a super cringy video years ago on this game. I don't encourage you to watch it. Terrible jokes aside, the content wasn't even quite there, although a lot of you guys still seem to like it. This time around though, I'm doing Dark Souls Remastered and I have a fully functional debug camera that was included with the debug menu that was unlocked by Hocrux. So thank you so much. This episode is packed to the brim and I don't wanna waste any more time editing the intro. So let's just jump straight into it. So there's a lot of great stuff to see, but I wanted to do this one first cause it's really fun to explain. So there's a boss fight that not everybody has ever seen before. I know that I didn't do it on my first run, but it's Gwendolyn and the Gwendolyn boss fight has something really interesting going on with it. What starts off of a hallway that looks like it's pretty short expands itself in this cutscene, and it looks like it's practically never ending even though it does technically end as well but how this effect is pulled off is really fascinating so the first thing i should mention is that there's technically two hallways there's the long one and then there's the short one but you'll never see both of them at the same time because one gets called out over the other depending on which one the game wants you to be in now the long hallway is used in the entirety of the cutscene where you encounter Gwendolyn and even though it looks like it starts off short that's not true instead it's a a flat texture that's cast against a concave geometry to make it look like it's short and then once the bright light is cast on it that little concave geometry that I was just talking about that gives you that illusion rises up out of bounds but the white light remains and just kind of shoves further and further into the back of an actual long long hallway and once you defeat Gwendolyn you can see the short hallway with the room in the back uncalled and revealed to be resting above it this whole time. And now we're gonna dedicate a whole section to looking at where certain things come from out of bounds. Boss to pop out of somewhere is the Asylum Demon who ends up jumping from the ceiling. I think on a controller, you can't even look up to see that there's a broken ceiling that he jumps through. But all the same, if we take the camera all the way out here, you can see that even before you open the door, this dude is using his tiny little wings the best he can. So what's really cool, by the way, is that before you step into the room, there's an exterior model that the player can normally not see this much detail of. And the second you step through there, you can see it it becomes an interior shot that's not modeled on all sides so now we get a perfect shot of the asylum demon jumping into frame which i do have to commend the developers canonically speaking i mean he could technically be flying in the air it, he doesn't need to be standing on something unless you wanted to start arguing physics and then you might remember the bridge demon kind of does the same thing pay no mind to the dragon it's just a weird glitch that happened and i have no idea why that happened but that's not what we're here for no instead what we're actually looking for is what the model looks like when it's inside of this building because he's not realistically hiding on top of the tower. Instead, you can see that his limbs are kind of bunched up and everything. And with this angle, you can see the exact moment that he jumps off of the roof, which I've got no additional commentary for except for the fact that I think it's neat. Anyways, going back to the dragon, yeah, I've, I've, two times I tried to get the dragon coming in and that's as many times as I'm willing to give it a shot. The first time he came in a little bit earlier than I thought and so I missed it. The second time, like I said, there was that glitch. But what I am showing you right now is where the dragon goes if you actually make it to the bonfire behind him. And he does fly quite a ways away before finally disappearing. Just gonna fly back to really give you a relation shot to where he ended up and where he was before. And we got Sif. Sif only shows up in a cutscene Scene. he's not hidden underneath the stage or anything like that but I will point out that the second that he pops into the cutscene the flowers around his model just completely disappear for some reason but looking at it from another angle like this seeing Sif on all fours on top of the grave looks a little ridiculous and I love it for the bell tower gargoyles before you go in they don't exist at all on the map but the second you step through the fog gate there is a very, very brief moment where they have different lighting entirely than how they do in the cutscene. And here you can see the transition from game to cutscene. You could just watch the contrast in real time. And one of the things I've always wanted to know, and I recently did a playthrough of Dark Souls 1 on my Switch. So this is fresh in my memory. I was thinking to myself, where does Oswald pop in? I have to know. Because what ends up happening is you go up the bell tower and somewhere between when you get up the bell tower and when you come back down, 
Oswald appears. So here I can show you the exact moment where that happens. And I guess it shouldn't be to anyone's real surprise, but it's right after the cutscene where the bell has rung. The cool news is though, is that even though it happens after the cutscene, the environment is all the same. It's not like a separate entity or anything like that. So I can still show you the exact frame in which Oswald appears, which I'm very thankful for the fact that he's not called out like some of the environment here, as you can clearly see. As you can see, the abyss is just a giant cylinder and the boss is just kind of spawn without being anywhere in the map, except you see one off out of bounds. And you might be thinking, which one is that? Is that the last one? Or is it all of them spawned in the same spot? And the answer to all that is no. <laughs> Instead, that's just the cutscene version of the boss. And it's only the cutscene when you defeat the boss too. So the second that you kill the boss, you will see that he warps out and he's immediately injected in to fulfill that scene. And of course, anybody that's even given Dark Souls a shot knows that this scene is the opening scene just before you're about to take control of the character. And you have Oscar drop down a key to get out of your cell. And I think a lot of people want to know exactly what's going on out there because you see a couple of plants growing over the whole of the cell. But as it turns out, there's nothing else out there except for the night and those couple of plants that the player was meant to see. Otherwise, it's all just skybox. And the only thing really interesting you get to see about the night itself is the last frame of animation that hangs for just a little bit outside of the player's view before disappearing entirely. Also, the rat that was in the opening cutscene hangs out just below the player at all times. Although it's difficult to make out all the details of the rat, I mean, it's clearly a silhouette of a rat. It's pretty safe that you could take my word for it. But what's really cool too is that we're stuck on the first frame of the game once the player takes control. Like the game is frozen on frame one. And because it's frozen on frame one, you get to see the T and A poses of various models that are already loaded in. So the second encounter with the Asylum Demon, that dude is in a complete A pose, which is pretty fantastic to see. Now, again, keep in mind, viewer, that if we were to have the game in motion, we would no longer be able to see these poses because they do start behaving as the game developers intended the second that he moves past frame one. But just a little bit of a treat for you. Out of bounds, frame one content. Then we got a viewer request from Arlo. Yeah, the fuzzy blue monster YouTuber. Try to recover from that news. If you ever want to leave me a viewer request, just follow me over on Twitter. Got the little Twitter bump in the lower left-hand corner and in the video description. Go ahead and give it a click if you want to find out what future episodes are. I think specifically he wanted to know how Big Framp is. Anyways, here's me jumping down the hole without Framp's permission. So he basically decides, I'm not doing anything else with you, goodbye. But I managed to freeze the game before he deloaded, and we kind of get to see how far down he goes when he rejects you, which also in turn makes it really easy to show you just how long Framp's model is. And it's very, very long, probably way longer than a lot of people were thinking. I certainly thought it wouldn't be this long since you only probably get to see about one third of it. But anyways, we got segments here and we're at the end of our first segment. So why don't we do a zoom out of the Undead Asylum once you reach the end? All right, now we're gonna be talking about areas and locations. The first one, which was featured in the original Dark Souls episode that I did, is right outside of Firelink Shrine. And it's that background that you can see right across from the bonfire. It's a whole town that is fully modeled. Now granted, it's low poly model, but there's so many details to this low poly model that it's astounding to me. And I don't quite understand why they put this much effort into it. I'm gonna try to take as much time as I can to kind of slowly guide you through all the intricate details, but without lining my commentary up to some of the stuff that you should be able to see here in this footage, there are things like bushes and loose boards, stuff that that would never be seen by the player's naked eye. And the only way you could possibly see this is if you took the camera up this close. And I honestly thought for the remaster that they would just replace this with a 2D texture, you know, save a ton of resources, do whatever it is that they did to make Blight Town not a laggy mess. But no, it's still here. And it honestly deserves its own live stream or separate video or something to really show you every single detail that goes into this town. But for now, we'll move on and I'll bring you over to the Lost Isolith instead. 
in this area, you can see all sorts of strange buildings off in the distance. And taking the camera over there too is really surprising because while it's not furnished or anything like that, there's a lot more depth to these buildings than you would ever imagine for something that's so far off in the distance. I've already shown you an example of us taking the camera inside the building to show you that it's kind of carved out or has a 3D model to represent an interior. Now taking the camera behind all this can show you just how many interiors exist that again would never be seen by the player. It's utterly fascinating to what lengths the environment artists for Dark Souls 1 were willing to go to. And moving away from detail and showing you some cool developer technique, here's New Londo Ruins. Now I'm a little bit surprised by this one. Obviously New Londo Ruins kind of takes place underground in a cavernous like area, but taking the camera outside of all of that will show you a strange blue texture and moving the camera even further can show you that all of New Londo Ruins is trapped inside of a blue box. And that blue box is also trapped inside of an orange sky dome. Now to show you the sky dome, you might notice that the blue box has turned into a triangle. I'm not sure why that happens. It's almost like an LOD effect or something, but I assure you at the correct length, you can see that it's just a blue box that's like I said, trapped inside of an orange sky dome, which is absolutely crazy. Always, I try to find weird geometry out of bounds. And in Blight Town, underneath the tree, you can find a lone plane that, like I said, is loaded into the Blight Town map. Now, it's really hard to kind of determine what the heck this thing is here for. Now, if I take my character over there and drop him on top of this platform, it will end up loading the Great Hollow. And he does land on solid ground right where that plane would be, but that plane does not accurately represent the ground that your character is walking on. And just because my character happened to land there and activate the Great Hollow map, this doesn't necessarily mean that's what that plane is meant for. The great example of what I mean here is that at the bottom of the Great Hollow is, as we all know, the Ash Lake, and inside the body of water where that mini boss is, there's a really tough to see second plane. This one's more vertical than the last one and has like a wood texture to it. And if we have our character try to drop or interact with this in any sort of way, nothing happens. He just falls right through, which means that these lone pieces of texture may have a purpose within the map itself instead of activating a whole map entirely. But speaking of activating maps, there was something that was really cool that I noticed. In Firelink Shrine, if you look down at this one spot, you might be able to notice something that looks like a cave, or at least it's something that looks a little different than just the rocky wall that you're used to seeing. And at first I was really confused, and then I started to think about it, and I was like, maybe this is the cave that leads to Blight Town. And so, depending where you are on the map will depend on whether or not you can potentially load this area. I was spending a lot of time just falling to my doom, because I was trying to get down there from the spot where you would actually be at the bonfire at Firelink Shrine. But if you go just a little more ways down where the fire keeper would be, it changes the collision of the map. And so by doing that, my character can actually land on a piece of ground. And then once that happens, guess what? It is exactly what I thought it would be. It's the cave to Blight Town, loaded in its entirety. Also, the elevator to New Londo Ruins. I thought it'd be really cool to take the camera out and just show you how the area loads and deloads depending on where you are on the elevator. It's also kind of fun to see just how big the elevator is from far away as well. And remember the white area just before the very end of the game? I thought it looked really cool, so I took the camera out just to see how it all connects together. And it's far less whimsical once you realize it's just a giant white glowing cuboid and that the last area exists in the same plane as the area where you open the door in the first place. Anyways, moving on with the next section, let's do another zoom out. This time I decided to do a zoom out of the bell tower area. Now this next topic is a bit of a weird one, but bear with me, I found it pretty entertaining and so I think you will too. It's where do you stand before certain areas of Dark Souls starts to load in? As you saw here with Firelink Shrine, we got this nice view here. And there are definitely areas where you can see that the graveyard is unloaded by standing at certain parts of the Firelink Shrine, but it's probably not very apparent 
unless you see the entire environment like this. And what it seems like is that the graveyard actually swaps out loads with the staircase down to New Londo Ruins. You can't have both at the same time. And so that's like a small little introduction. Let's ramp it up and talk about something I think a lot of you might be more interested in. What about a big freaking area like the Undead Berg? At what point does your character stand in a spot that loads this entire area that's completely different from Firelink Shrine? Well, it's a lot sooner than you might think, honestly. If I was asked that, I would assume that when you're in that sewage tunnel, somewhere between there you lose Firelink Shrine and you gain Undead Berg. But no, instead, you still get a portion of Firelink Shrine, but you get Undead Berg right here on the hill that leads to the sewage area. And so I'm being just a little bit of a chatterbox here so we can all see the camera pan all the way out like this so that you don't lose your frame of reference for the main character. Now we can watch him walk up the hill and it's at this exact spot you got yourself an undead berg. And then that little area just after Andre the blacksmith, you got this indoor area with little glimpses of a forest peeking out of crumbled runes. But it's very dark, and when you get out of this building, it is definitely not quite as dark. So how do they pull off this effect? It's a lot less complicated than you would think. Pan the camera out is going to show you that there's a couple of trees that are planted there, and then behind that is just these really choppy looking deconstructed domes that are placed on both sides. And in Lost Isleth, I wanted to show you the slide from another angle. I thought that would be kind of fun. It's a bit of a long slide as you go down to the boss. And I thought it would be really neat to just watch the main character slide down this while also showing you the slide in almost its entirety in one shot. Also, here's an angle of this boss that you normally don't get to see. This thing's pretty massive and you don't ever get to really loop around it because you go inside of it. Spoilers, I guess. Plus, the whole fight scene is so chaotic, it's not really often that you get to soak in all the details of this particular boss. And also, the fog gate. Now, obviously, every single time you go through a fog gate, it's going to be a little bit different, but I figure for Quelag's fog gate, I take the camera out of bounds to show you the full circumference of where the fog gate starts and ends. But here's one that might really shock you. How about when you sit at a bonfire? Did you ever stop to think about what that amber fog looks like as it resets the map for you? You ever thought about how that looks out of bounds? I honestly didn't. <laughs> and I accidentally got footage of what that looks like one time. And so I went back and redid it and got you some really good footage of the fact that that fog technically isn't HUD. It's placed in front of the camera. And so what you got to see was both what it looks like when enemies placements are completely reset and what the entirety of that bonfire fog looks like from another angle. We're gonna do Undead Berg here and it's gonna be at the top of the tower where you come across the second Black Knight. All right, let's start talking about a fun one. This is character models. Let's start with the human characters without any helmets on. What does that look like inside of the geometry? Now, I'm a little bit surprised by this one because they have flat eyes. In other words, not orbs for eyeballs, but they have eye sockets for some reason. I say for some reason because I can't think of any scenario in which you would see the eye socket of an NPC character or your own character model in Dark Souls. And before anyone says, well, when you're undead, obviously, but like that's a completely separate model and the eye sockets of the undead versions don't match up with this at all. And speaking of eye sockets, almost all of the humanoid characters that are undead in Dark Souls have glowing red eyes, but once they're dead, you can see that they have eye sockets. However, there is one enemy in this game and I don't know if this is just like a beta element that got left behind, like a scrapped idea that the team just kind of overlooked, but this one enemy type has eyes and it's not easy to see with the red glow, and it's probably why it made it into the final build of the game. But if we take the camera further back to an enemy that is not locked on the player, you can see what this looks like without the red glow. This is really bizarre. Again, if you find any other undead in the game, it's just eye sockets. So it's so strange that this standalone type of enemy happens to have eyeballs. And whether or not this enemy has eyeballs is completely up to you. To me, they kind of have like superhero eyes, like Venom or Spider. 
Spider-Man or something. But anyways, taking the camera up close can show you that they have white thin eyes, which is another very bizarre one. Once again, I show this off to you guys because typically you're going to find that when engaging with these enemies, there's a red glow that completely covers up these details. Now here's one that's really difficult to see. The crystal lizard. I was actually pretty shocked to see that if you take the camera really up close, they do in fact have their own eyeballs. It's just really difficult to see because the enemy is so small and the eyeballs are kind of covered up by its own furrowed brow. And then I want to show you the blacksmith in New Londo Ruins. Taking the camera inside of his cell can show you that he's not actually sitting on the environment. Instead, just kind of floating in mid-air so that the player could see him better. Speaking of characters that are locked in a cell, the Firekeeper for Firelink Shrine, as you know, is really difficult to get a good look at. So I took the camera inside the cell and put it up to her face to show you some of the finer details of the model. And honestly, I'm a little surprised by this, but the character I believe is blind and also mute. And then there's Guinevere. Now in the original episode, I made a mistake of taking my character over there. And if she gets one point of damage, she will die. So she has one HP. This time we're just using the camera. So that won't be an issue. And I just wanted to show you that the character surprisingly is modeled in a very intentional way with the developers knowing full well that this model would never be seen from behind to the player. And so back parts of the leg and her back are simply not modeled. And then there's my favorite character, Zygmire Katarina. Even have a little figurine of him behind me. He's awesome and he's also one of the characters where you could do a little bit of boundary breaking of yourself to see that his head is fully modeled inside the helmet. This is mostly because the helmet is so massive. There's also a giant slit in the helmet itself. So the developers really wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to see what it would look like inside, which is really cool. But the other characters have a bit of a dilemma. By equipping a helmet, you lose the details of the character. Now, I lost this footage, but I just take my word for it. Solaire in the vanilla game, if you went inside his helmet, would be bald and would be missing his chin. But there's this mod that I found thanks to the YouTube channel Crestfallen, which I highly recommend you guys check out if you want to see more characters from Dark Souls 1 without their helmet. I'll leave a link to it in the video description too. Why not? Anyways, these are the actual faces just without their helmet wear, which made me really surprised to find out that Havel had a fully modeled head. And I say that because by taking the camera inside of the original OG helmet, there would be no evidence of a face in there, but there was weird details to the helmet. I'll show it here in Blender like if you remove layers of the helmet, you'll see like a low poly version of the helmet inside the helmet. It was different, very different. Anyways, moving on to Quilag, I know what all of you want me to check out. So I got you covered. And yes, inside of Quilag's face, there seems to be a weird plane just behind her eyeballs, which is bizarre. I can't really explain why that would be the case. It must be a modeling error. But what's even cooler than that is that her eyeballs are like blood red, not bloodshot, like straight up blood red like pure crimson blood and then her teeth are metallic she has little fangs and in case you're wondering no the regular human models don't get fangs like that. So that's kind of like specific to Quilag. And also there's a mole on her face. If you look at the mole really closely, it looks like it's just like a drop of blood and not actually a mole. And now let's talk about the Mimic. There's a lot of cool things to talk about here. First of all, I just want to compare the original chest to a Mimic chest. And I know that the big giveaway is that if you look at a chest long enough, you might see the Mimic move, which a regular chest won't do that. So like that's the easiest indication to know that you're dealing with a Mimic chest. But in case you don't want to sit around and wait for the Mimic chest, there's two indicators that will tell you whether or not it's a fake. A real chest will have the heart shape of this little emblem by the lock face facing outward, whereas the mimic chest is in reverse, so you'll never see like the heart aspect, they just look like points. Also, this is the biggest giveaway of them all, I find it to be a very safe and reliable way to pick apart a mimic chest quickly. A real chest has a low level of detail strip underneath the lock whereas the Mimic chest has a, a bit of a ridge and down the center, giving it a little bit of extra detail. And that'll always be the dead giveaway, even without a special camera. Anyways, now that I got that out of the way for you, let's look at what's going on with the Mimic before you activate it, which that's the most fascinating aspect, right? Because underneath the environment, you'll find the body of the Mimic. It's just kind of scrunched up and it's really fun to show you exactly what's gonna happen with that body, but I'll get to that in just a second. Inside the box, you can see the tongue kind of coiled up 
but all the contents of the mimic is there it's kind of cool it's just that everything that's supposed to be below the mimic is still below the mimic and now we're going to show you what that looks like when you attack the mimic and he sort of springs out of the ground you can see his tiny little truncated limbs just kind of inflate i'll even put in slow motion so that you can really see that come to life it's cool and there you go out of bounds mimic now moving on to Gwendolyn. this character has a lot going on so taking the camera inside of the helmet will show you that there is a fully modeled head just no eyes but there's like weird crusty little cracks in the model which is really fascinating to see but the intrigue of the model doesn't even end there as you can see Gwendolyn has snakes for feet and taking the camera inside of the clothing can show you that Gwendolyn has metallic legs which is a bizarre choice I this is what like an untextured leg looks like maybe or a placeholder or you know what I think I know what's going on here maybe the legs basically have no detail texture wise but it's using the same sheen effect as the snakes themselves I and mean, it just looks very different on smooth human skin And then for these necromancer-like characters, there's a bit of an art error going on here, and I thought it would be really cool to look at it up close. Their teeth has a flat sheet to represent them, and so, sadly, there's no alpha channels, and looking around the teeth will show you this weird, crusty-looking thing that almost resembles gums. It's, it's a bad look. <laughs> It's, and it's not common either. That's why I felt the need to point it out. Anyways, with that segment out of the way, let's do a zoom out of Ash Lake. All right, next section. Weird little things that I found out of bounds. And one of the best examples of that is this lever right after the dragon. If you take the camera inside, there's like two similarly textured cylinders, but for what reason they're here, I have no idea. It kind of looks like the cylinders that are on each side of the circles, but it's different and it's Still doesn't explain why it's there. And this one is pretty huge. Honestly, stuffing it way at the end of the video like this is not really doing it service. I might have to make a short at some point. But in the last area where you place the Lord Vessel on the opposite side of the wall so it's completely hidden, there's an open archway that is clearly large enough for the player to walk through, which I feel like there's no other way to interpret this. This is clearly something that the player was meant to be able to explore at one point and was later stripped out of the game. <laughs> Unused content, everybody. You know you love it. And of course, we gotta take the camera crew and Orlando. There's a ton of buildings out here that the player never gets close to whatsoever. It's basically the town of Anne Orlando. And while we're out here, I just wanna say, if you've been enjoying this video, please subscribe. I only say this because I know a lot of you don't even check your sub boxes, but if you do subscribe, it's way, way more likely that YouTube will actually recommend it to your homepage. So there really is a huge benefit to hitting that sub button. Oh. Also, I had an Elden Ring video. There's two of those videos and both of them didn't do quite as well as some of the other FromSoft YouTubers. So if you give them a watch, I'd, be, I'd appreciate it. All right, guys, take care.